Thank you for coming to our talk. Um, yeah, we'll just be, I guess, going through a little bit about what we're doing at Tesco. Um, mainly, so uh, Guillermo and I will um, just basically show two um, slightly different areas of how we're using data science, but in particular with relation to um, how we're designing solutions um, on the Tesco cluster and stuff that actually has to be in production and reasonably large solutions as well with their own challenges. Um, brief introduction. Um, so, um, I'm Trevor, um, lead data scientist um, in the area of forecasting um, at Tesco. Um, and then uh, Guillermo is um, leading the area of personalization and recommendations for kind of online um, search and recommendation stuff. The very brief uh, introduction to Tesco, I guess pretty much all of you will have, have come across Tesco. It's a large company. Um, um, one, uh, one of the largest um, grocery retailers um, in the world, kind of top few. Um, I guess from a data science point, it's just nice for us because this means that actually where we can make small improvements, this can actually have a very large impact across quite a, a, a big, large business, which is just, I guess, more fun, fun for us, really. As far as the uh, data science team, um, there are about 40... 45, I think, people um, in, um, now in, in the team. Um, there's a mixture of people with backgrounds much from academics, so people that have gone through PhDs and postdocs and things like that, um, or uh, people that have got a lot of experience in industry, um, all mixed together from lots of areas of science and maths and computer science. Um, and we, all, we need this range of different backgrounds of, of people, in part just because actually we get to work across the whole of the business. So we're a centralized group um, getting to do any, things from supply chain, online, as I said, um, and certain just uh, um, across in stores and, and everything like that. So just a brief introduction to the, the thing. On to the main part of um, the talk, really. Um, so I would like to talk to you today about um, what we do for forecasting. Now, forecasting impacts the whole of a, a business like Tesco. <clears throat> be it whether you're worrying about uh, payroll, you know, how many people you need in the store. Obviously, you've got the, um, I guess, the, the traditional forecasting part that people think of is um, supply chain, you know, um, how much stuff do I need in store tomorrow um, so that I can actually order it uh, um, and things like that. But it really does affect across the whole of the business. <clears throat> now, the specific project that we were looking at um, was basically how do we take, we're looking much more here at the financial side of forecasting. So what I mean by that is things that we do that impact operations that start from um, kind of, you know, week scales out to a year and impact things like payroll. We want to do things like budgeting, um, so kind of making targets for the following year. Um, and this impacts both at a store level, so people looking after stores, um, as you can see, so that's the, the bit at the top. And then the piece at the bottom is um, actually the commercial teams who are doing buying and selling and things also have to have sets of targets um, and things they're working towards and will also have their own sets of forecasts. Now, the typical thing being that actually each group of people will have their own... Um, they, they will look after their area. So each, say, team in uh, the commercial side will say, well... I look after, I don't know, apples or, you know, uh, tinned fruit or something like that. Um, and I will know how they act and I will make forecasts for that group. And you get lots and lots of people making their own analysis at that level. Um, separately to that, you have a, like, central finance, for example, worrying about budgets um, and maybe marketing campaigns that they know are going to be coming out through the year and, and worrying about that. And separately to that, you have people worrying about stores and store payroll. And so what you can end up with is quite a disparate set of forecasts where actually when you, for instance, if you took all of the product uh, group forecasts, in theory, if you add them all together, you end up with a top line, a state, a whole of, you know, Tesco forecast. Whereas, of course, that's a completely different number to when you're at, where the people have actually made the estate forecast. So how do you actually bring all that together? And, and, and that was mainly the, the kind of the, the crux of this project. How, how do we do that? Um, and we have a reasonable number of forecasts here that, that we need to be making. So, you know, tens, tens of thousands in the end. Um, uh, 
So <clears throat> the first place we start is with, with requirements. So what requirements does the business have? And actually separately, what requirements do we have as data scientists? Because you know, we have other things that we need out of these projects as well. So for the business, they need a single view of all the forecasts. Um, they need results um, once a week, at the beginning of the week. <coughs> um, they would like to be um, you know, forecasting sales, but maybe they need you know, profit or number of items they're selling um, or something else. Um, they need sufficient accuracy. So obviously, we need to work out what sufficient means. Um, and the other bit is that whatever we implement, we don't want to throw away expertise that is in the business. So you might think, OK, well, we've got a, a load, um, some people running their separate models, each of whom will probably have a slightly different way of analyzing things. But they also, um, and, and maybe we can put in some better maths. But actually, in reality, they have a lot of business knowledge that you, you just don't want to be throwing away. Um, so how do we incorporate that? From the data science side, um, obviously, we, we want a, a solution that is easy to iterate. I don't want to do a, oh, I've made a forecast system. Here you go. Um, and then that's it. Um, I, I will need to have many developers working on the code um, for something like this, which actually ends up being quite a large project. Um, another um, thing that we put in as a requirement for ourselves was we don't want to make a forecasting system for this specific problem. We want to make a forecasting system that we apply to this specific problem. Now, what that then means is that when the next forecasting project comes along, uh, the, the amount of work to like, roll out the next thing is, is vastly reduced. So that's, that's what we want to do. <clears throat> and then going on from that, once actually you did get to the stage of having multiple um, projects going on in forecasting, how do you actually make sure that uh, developments you make in one project will be um, improving a different project? And so everything is working together rather than having lots of disparate pieces of work. First thing, metrics. Um, don't particularly want to talk a, a long time about th this, but as we know, that the first thing you always need to do in your data science project um, is to work out how are you going to measure success, success? Um, because if you don't, you won't, act, you know, usually basically the project will fail because nobody has agreed to how it succeeds and therefore nobody ever thinks the, the project has finished or succeeds. So first things first. Uh, for forecasting, the, um, we did something that I think is reasonably typical, is you take the mean absolute percentage error. Um, and whereas I guess um, in um, general machine learning, you just you choose a bit of the data and you, you take that separately. For forecasting, it's important that you worry about the time series aspect. So the piece of data that you pull a, apart for scoring, you make sure is effectively the end um, of, your, of your time series. So I effectively, I cut off the last year's worth of data, and I simulate um, making rolling forecasts um, and see how I would actually um, manage it in, 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 a, in a real life of, of, of data that I haven't seen in the future, rather than it just being a piece of data somewhere in time. <clears throat> of course, uh, ways of working. Um, it was nice to see the, um, the, the talk, the keynote this morning, which um, had a, a, a lot of this in it, actually, um, which was good to see. Um, for us, the, the thing that um, we have, we work with the Agile process. Um, so for those of you who do know what it is, you know what it is. And for those who don't, um, it's probably best to talk to us afterwards rather than having an introduction now. But it's useful. I think one of the things that we have found particularly key um, over the past a um, couple of years almost, is changing the data science team from a team that makes prototypes, that hands those prototypes to engineers, to making a team that is writing the production code with the help of engineers. Um, and one of the key ways we found that's been very useful for this is, is something called test-driven development, which again was not in those words explained this morning, where before you write your production code, you write your tests and how you expect stuff to behave. Um, and then after that, you write your code um, and slowly making all your tests pass until you have code that does what you think it should be doing. Um, and this is just it's a very useful way for even people who aren't maybe used to productionizing to be making decent code that you can then use later on. 
Um, we use tools like Git. Um, we, co we code review. Um, so every, every, every piece of code that goes through a data scientist and an engineer will um, both review everything that goes through to make sure that you've, kind of, you've got both aspects of what people care about when they're reviewing code. Um, so to come on to actually the design of what we did, um, so what I want to take you very quickly through in the next um, few minutes is um, those iterations and the process that we went through to come up with our final design. So the, the, where we started was this is all written in Python. Um, and it's a very typical, I guess, machine learning um, process where we've got some data. We need to do some cleaning or data transformations to get it into um, make the data in the form that our models will need to consume. Um, then we had um, a piece of automatic model selection there, so we can actually just run a whole different bunch of models, work out which was the best model, and then we use that for the forecasting. Um, again, the way we can score all those models is by using that, the make of the, the, the rolling forecast, as, um, as we talked about before. We put in a few other little bits and pieces, so like, um, a, a, a small package which just when you took in any new time series you could just quickly run it through and it would give you, you know, your, your typical set of graphs that are useful for looking at that, that stuff. Um, similarly for the output of the models um, we didn't just output make, we, you know, we worried about things like bias um, and then a few other metrics that were just you know, quick and easy to um, set, see what sorts of things were happening. Obviously, you would probably do more deeper dives in those things, but just made those quick packages to make some of the work a bit easier for ourselves. OK. <clears throat> um, the previous slide was, in fact, what you would do for forecasting a single store. OK, so if I want to worry about the sales, say, for the coming year of a single store, the, the previous process. Now we're going on to, we want to do 3,000 stores, approximately. Uh, and so what, we, what the decision that we made was, um, so we at Tesco have a cluster. <coughs> there are various, um, and one of those things that's often talked about when you have you know, your, your big data cluster is you, know, you should use something like um, Spark, PySpark, or whatever very version you're um, caring about. Um, and what this does is it's a, a way of being able to write your, your code that gets distributed across a cluster of you know, um, different cores that can then run their different processes and bring everything together. Now, in theory, um, it's, um, it would be a good idea if you could write everything in PySpark so that the, um, the back end could sort of deal with all that parallelization itself. We decided not to do that. Um, and the reason is, is because Py, while PySpark is, is very good for that distribution stuff, it's not necessarily always the best thing for um, your modeling part of your process. So especially for stuff like time series, um, or you, know, you want to try something new um, and do something a bit different, Python's got a, a lot more packages and stuff already there. Um, and things you can and worry about, and maybe also some things which don't paralyze very well anyway. So sort of, um, why push that? So what we did is we used PySpark as the wrapper around Python um, to do the parallelization. So then we have data processing that comes in that's all done in the nice PySpark that you know, is nice parallel distribution that PySpark is excellent at. Um, and then you output a um, a data frame where, if you like, each row of that data frame is the, is the data that you would need for that goes into a model. So let's say the first row would be store one's sales for the past, I don't know, five years, plus some information on what, I don't know, the weather was doing or what events were happening or, or anything like that. And that becomes a single row. And then you just apply the Python function to every single row of your data frame. And what then happens is PySpark uses that to now send all of my store forecasts off to um, different nodes itself. So I almost use PySpark like a queuing mechanism. Um, so then I can parallelize that part, bring it all back together, um, and do some post-processing. Okay. That was iteration number two. And then I guess getting back to more now what the final iteration looks like. So 
part of, so th this is, I guess, more almost down the, the processes that we needed for making forecasting. So what, uh, the first thing, if we can see, we've got pipeline 1A, uh, 2A, and 3A. Um, those, if you would like, would be, I'm going to make forecasts at the high level of um, you know, the central forecasts. I would also make forecasts at a store level, so forecasting sales. And I would also make forecasts at um, product level, forecasting products. And I have each of those as a different um, pipeline. Um, and then I bring them together, and I have to do some reconciliation to actually make sure that they align with each other. Now, the nice thing is that now they're all, they're all sort of running similar models. So you do expect the numbers to be pretty close to each other, but there's still going to be a little bit of tweaking that you're going to need to do to make them all actually align. Um, so that's the first part. Um, secondly, then that gets passed on to what we call the early warning system. Now, I think this is something which we've brought in a little bit later, but will be very important for us going forwards. Now, what the early warning system is, is basically a barrage of tests on the outputs of my forecast um, that kind of encode, if I was to look at my forecast, when would I notice that they were probably wrong? Um, so these could be things like, for example, if I'm in, um, let's say this is uh, the beginning of January now or something like that, and I want to forecast out for the first week of May, I would make a forecast for that. Then in the second week of January, I would rerun my forecasting algorithm, and I would again look at the first week of May and see what that forecast is doing. Now, if that forecast is varying lots, I would go, oh, wait a sec, maybe my models aren't um, very stable. What's going on? Has some other data come in? I, so I can encode that as a test and put it into my barrage of tests for the early warning system. Now, the reason this is important um, is because as a data scientist, you're fundamentally trying to make a, a data product that you want to be able to um, walk away from that project. Now, it's not to say that you will um, never be called up to go and fix something or that, that you might want to iterate on it later on or you might want to make improvements, but you don't want to handhold it forever. You want to be able to hand off to another team which doesn't necessarily have um, data science capabilities, but maybe some analytics capabilities or something. So by putting this in place, you're, you're saying, OK, well, this helps me make a product where, OK, if something comes out of this early warning system, that's where you should go and look. And if you have real trouble, then come and see us and put something in our backlog. And, and that just helps that piece. Of course, it also helps with general analysis as we're making this in the first place and iterating. After that, um, we have... Uh, what we call overlays, and these are basically judgmental adjustments. So these forecasts are sent off to the business, different parts of the business, so the central team will, have, will know some stuff about marketing that's coming on later in the year that we don't necessarily have in our model. The store managers might know there's going to be road closures in their particular stores. The guys in commercial might have noticed also maybe some other marketing thing that's not on a state level but kind of a more local um, thing. And so they can go, well, you haven't, you haven't captured that. Um, there's actually no source of data for that. But we know vaguely what the uplift is going to be or, or opposite. Um, and so we can put that in ourselves. And so you get that judgmental piece on top, which you can feed again through to the whole system. So that's what the overlays are. Um, and what we do as far as structuring this is we make sure that each of these things happen separately. So on once a week, I would run this thing, and it would run through the whole lot. But it may. But the forecasting part takes quite a long time. But, the, but the adding the judgmental overlay stuff doesn't. So if somebody needs to say, well, actually, I've got some more judgmental stuff I need to put in, um, they then just quickly run the last part of the driver and job done. And nearly passing there. Cool. Um, just briefly to say that um, you should store all your data you can. So when this is outputting to users and stuff, and people are putting in comments that they did find road closures, you should always shove all that back into your data set because you never know what you might be able to do later on when you come back to it and you've got some actual history of, of how people have used um, your forecasts. Um, I'm just going to quickly wrap up the session before um, I pass over. Just to say that um, I guess through all of this, um, you can see we've got, we can do this with a signal code base. Um, we, it's very actually the, the way just by that that structure isn't really specific to a certain type of forecasting. That structure works for everything. So you just need a new set of data 
um, and maybe the exact you know, cleaning you do for a specific data set um, is, is specific to your forecast, but you can kind of um, you know, work that out and you've built most of the structure already. Um, um, and yeah, so we, and by doing that, by running things on Git, we can share models um, and have everyone work on the same code base. Um, and yeah, actually, a project like this does actually take quite a few different sets of people from finance who, are, who want the forecasts, <coughs> data engineers making sure that any extra data we need goes into the correct system, us as data science working with the pipeline team who worry about the continuous development and uh, development operations, um, people writing a user interface, and then you know, like a project manager, an agile coach stuff, kind of looking over the whole thing. So quite a big piece together. And I think that's the end of my bit, and I'll leave it to you. Thanks, Brad. Um, OK, so now I will show you a little bit uh, of a different project where, where we are trying to do data science at scale in Tesco. And this one is going to be recommendation systems. Um, I have seen already some talks about recommendation system in this conference, and it's nice because it's a, an interesting topic that can be applicable to many different problems and many different sectors. Here, I'm not going to go into any detail about algorithms, collaborative filtering, or something like this. I think it has been covered. Uh, here, uh, the main points are going to be how we are integrating a complex recommendation system in a business. So let's start, first of all, with an example of recommendations in Tesco. Uh, we sell food. Um, and these are the recommendations, for example, if you search for cheese. Uh, so if you search for cheese, the search engine is going to retrieve cheese, hopefully. Um, and then we want to recommend you what we think you may want to do next. So ham, for example. Uh, so this is a, a specific example or a specific recommendation in Tesco. But well, I think it will illustrate a little bit what we do. Uh, so let's start talking about uh, which is our environment, so where we work, um, and then so, some, uh, let's talk a little bit about our goals. Um, in terms of our environment, I think it makes sense to split it in two different worlds, completely different worlds. Uh, we have to talk about the big data environment. Uh, if we think about recommendations, we are talking about mainly two data sources, uh, transactional data, where we log all the transactions, uh, so customer ID and product ID and the price of the product, at that given moment in time, uh, both for online and in-store shops, if you have used the club card. Um, so there we have like a lot of information about what customers have purchased in the past. Um, but then also, if you want to uh, generate recommendations for the web page, it's really useful to take a look at clickstream data. And in clickstream data, we log uh, all the single interactions of a customer across the online journey. So what the customer see and click and add and remove and append and so on. Um, so we, these two um, data sources, if you stop and think about it, and you look at the numbers in the slide, so like 10 million daily unique customers or 12,000 every hour online sessions, uh, and from every online session we log all interactions, the amount of data you end up is huge, and this is the reason why we need to leverage big data technologies on our big data cluster in order to process all this information. Uh, so the work on the big data environment, I would say that is the, the work of the data scientist in the saddle with the computer and the data. Um, and there what we do is we process all the data, we prepare our train sets. Sometimes we train our models using big data technology. Some other times you can sample your data, uh, maybe move the data to the cloud if you want to leverage GPUs or something like this. Uh, but at the end, the main idea is that you have a huge amount of data and you need to leverage these technologies. But then, of course, the recommendations have to be served to the customers and have to be served uh, on the web page online. Um, so if you start thinking about complex models where you want to run some of the computation online, so it's not only batch process, uh, then you have to start thinking about a low latency serving API or world. Um, of course, we are not in charge of the API. Uh, there is an API team who, is, who are the owners of this, of this part. But it's interesting because it uh, gives us some constraints. So, if you need to run a model and you need to run it online and you are going to have a lot of transactions per second, uh, then you need to ensure that your model can run uh, in a decent amount of time. So you can come up with the best model in the world. Uh, if it takes one second, it's not used. Also, apart from that, it's also interesting to understand the link between both worlds because if we have some features that we are creating on the big data environment, but those features have to be used on the uh, API side, in order to serve the recommendations, you need to ensure that both things are on sync 
all the time. If you deploy a model, you need to ensure that the model that you are deploying performs exactly the same as the one you, you were training on the big data platform, and so on and so forth. So this is the environment I think is interesting to, to work with. Uh, it gives some constraints and also some advantages as having all the data in the big data platform. Once we know that, let's take a look at the goals. Uh, recommendation systems can be used for many different purposes. In our case, the main KPI or goal is to reduce friction. Uh, I don't know if you have ever tried to buy food online in any retailer, uh, but it's kind of difficult sometimes. There are a lot of products. Sometimes it's difficult to find what you are looking for. Um, if it's too personalized, then you are seeing all the, the same products all the time, which is not good either. Uh, so at the end, uh, one of the main goals of having a good recommendation system is to reduce the friction of, of the customer so uh, they can find what they are looking for as soon as possible. Um, and yeah, it, it has a strong link with uh, improving customer experience, in our opinion, or it's at least what the business think about. Uh, of course, there are other KPIs, like uh, inspiring our customers is an important thing for Tesco. Uh, we sell food, and at the end, inspiring our customers is all about helping them to discover new recipes, new ways of uh, combining products. If you add a new product into range or a seasonal product, let the customers find it. Uh, but you have to do it in a controlled manner. If you, you cannot expand the customer with all the new products. Uh, this is the reason why it's important to have a good recommendation system where you understand what the customer wants to see, so you can inspire them in a, in a tailored way. Um, very link, uh, strongly linked with Inspire Our Customers is the product discovery. Um, and also, there might be other goals. I, have, I put here supplier promotions. There can be many. So let me explain you a little bit now um, of the journey we have traveled so far in recommendation. Everything started with there was a business owner with a problem. We have a carousel on displacement, and we want to improve our recommendations there. Uh, can you help us? And yes, we could. So we said, OK, let's start thinking about which data we want to use, which exploratory work we want to do. And then we find a model that we are OK with, and we think about how to serve the recommendations. We serve the recommendations. We create the value. Everybody was happy. Uh, but we had an end-to-end -end pipeline. And after the first use case, there was a second use case and a third use case. Uh, we said, well, let's stop here, take a step back. Uh, every use case is unique. but they are all sharing a lot of common things. So let's take a couple of step backs, think about which are the pieces that you can generalize and try to abstract them. Uh, so we can create a generic framework that is simple and flexible enough so you, it can fit any problem, but also it's not a constraint for future development. Uh, this is the result of that thinking process. Uh, as you can see, it's very simple. Uh, so what we have here is a two-layer framework. Uh, where we have two different stages. The first one is a candidate generation, and the second one is a ranking model. Uh, the candidate generation is aiming to narrow down from all available products in Tesco to just a few hundred of products for a given customer, a given moment in time, and a given business goal. Um, so this is the context. Uh, the candidate generation will de strongly depend on the context, and this is the reason why it has two inputs, all available products, and a contextual trigger that is going to define how we want to narrow down all those products. And the reason to narrow down all those products is that you end up with a subset of few hundreds, and you can start training in a supervised manner a ranking model uh, that is kind of decoupled from the candidate generation part, um, and when you can maximize whatever the metric you, you can think about. If you think about reducing friction, as we will see later, you can mm, maximize the log likelihood of your data or whatever. Uh, the other part that I have not speaked about yet is the contextual features. Once you have your product subset, the subset of candidates, you need to enrich those candidates with features. Um, here is where data scientists can be very creative, and you can think about any feature you may want to create uh, in order to add more information to solve the specific recommendation for a given customer on a specific moment in time. Um, so this is the generic framework. Um, one of the nice things about it is that it's uh, very flexible, as I said. So for example, the candidate generation step, it can be a very complex model, like a sequence-based model, or it can be as simple as uh, a use case where we want to make recommendations for St. Valentine, and we have 400 products related with St. Valentine. The candidate generation is given by the business, because we have already narrowed down from all products in Tesco to only those 400 that are related with St. Valentine. So 
It can be as simple as a business rule, or it can be as complex as any model you can think about. And now I would like to illustrate this generic framework with a specific use case uh, that we are doing. Uh, so the problem here is next item in basket recommendations. Uh, so again, you search for cheese, and I want to recommend you ham, for example. Uh, in the slide, you can see like a summarized version uh, of a customer journey with all the different ads on all the different locations. So if we stop at a, moment, a given moment in time, we can see that the customer has searched for uh, toilet roll. Um, and we know everything the customer has already in the basket so far. And the task is, if we, if we, aim, if we aim to reduce friction, uh, we may want to predict what the customer was going to do next. Or next, or next. The amount of steps ahead you want to go is something that depends strongly on the problem. Uh, if you only take one step ahead, then this action is going to be very correlated with the current action. If you move farther away in the future, the problem is that maybe you don't have a strong signal uh, to predict with. So this is the problem statement, and now how we solve it. Um, so here, what we have as a contextual trigger is a search query and a customer. We know which is the customer, and we know the search query. Um, and let's say, for example, that we're going to use here a sequence-based a sequence model where we know all the products that you have already in the basket, and we want to predict what, what's likely to happen next. Um, we can take the products that are more likely to appear and say, OK, the top 300, those are going to be my candidates. Here in the candidate generation, the only import we care about recall, uh, because you don't want to leave uh, true positives out. If you leave them out, they are not going to be recommended. Um, so we have a list of 300 products, and now we need to enrich those products with, you, with features. Um, and as I said, here is where uh, you can be very creative. Um, I have uh, put in the slide like five different logical groups of features that I think is, are important for our problems. Personalized features is where all the collaborative filtering uh, you may have heard uh, fits into. Like uh, personalized features can be explicit information, like how many times you have purchased a product, or it can be implicit information, how much do we think you like the product. Um, they can be whatever. Uh, but at the end, you are trying to capture the relationship between the product, uh, sorry, between the user and each of the products in the candidate list. Replenishment cycle about whether you need to replenish a specific product or not. Real-time features are very important, like the current price of the basket, the current the current size of the basket, the, sequ the sequence of products that you have in the basket, and so on. Those are features that have to be computed in real time on the API. Again, it's very cool, but it's another constraint because it's something that takes time and takes computational power. And then, of course, user-based and feature-based features are just descriptors of the customer and, and, the, and the products themselves. Um, and once we ha you have the, this matrix, it's, it's a supervised problem. Um, basically, you have your matrix of features for each of the candidates, and you want to predict which of them were indeed purchased next. So this is a very imbalanced, supervised problem. Uh, you can use other metrics like pairwise loss functions, uh, doesn't matter really. Uh, it's just a decision, uh, design decision that you need to take, and at the end is what works better for your specific problem. Here I put the example of a deep learning model, um, like a yeah deep MLP, where you are just trying to maximize uh, the cross entropy of your data, um, and that's it. At the end, uh, it's going to output a probability for each of the candidates, um, and you can rank by the probability. If you want to think about, for example, no, I want to encourage my model to recommend novel products. Then you can give a higher reward if uh, it's given higher probability to products that have not been purchased never before by that customer, and so on. So now it's starting to uh, think about how to define a cost function that really represents the business goal of the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, I think that's all what I had from my presentation. I try to be uh, fast. Uh, so yeah, we are hiding. Um, uh, we have a stand in front of the in front of the room. Um, yeah, the vacancies are in Welling or in Farringdon. But yeah, if you are interested, just yes, please come and talk to us. There are many other projects apart from forecast or recommendations. So if you if you just want to know more, uh, please come talk to us. Um, so that's it. If there are any questions. So we've got five minutes for questions, so put your hands up and... 
Hi. Uh, it's more for Trevor, I guess. Uh, it's with respect to how you parallelize your workflow. Yeah. So I can understand you condensing your raw data into a single data frame. Yeah. Did I understand correctly then that you're running a separate Python process per row in that data frame? That's correct. And how are you doing that? Um, UDFs. User yeah, it's just you put your whole Python package basically in as a UDF for each row. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Thanks for the talk. Same topic again. Um, how do you manage um, stacking models and aggregating models in that framework? Do you have to kind of do it explicitly and like create a whole new model which is a stack of two other models, or can you automatically, you know, you say you've got like one. Like, GM, like GBM model, you've got a neural network, and you actually think you might get good results by stacking their forecasts or like averaging them. Um, <laughs> oh, so you mean for, for once you've done all the models, what you actually do with that? Well, no, like, I mean, so it's quite common to um, have a stack of models where the output of one model goes into another model, yeah. or you might aggregate several models' results to get a better forecast. Sure. Can your, can your kind of scaling forecasting system handle that automatically? Um, at the moment, um, I would say the, the part where you do, so at the moment we're choosing the best the model, changing that to not just choosing the best one but doing some um, on, ensemble or something is pretty easy to put in. Um, I think the, the stacking of models isn't something we've needed to do yet, um, but I, I guess that again, hopefully the fr m framework is modular enough that you just pull it apart and put bits where you need to. Yeah, I mean, effectively, what you would have is you would have the output of a model going into your features or on, that goes into that row that you then pass to, through everything. So, Thank you. Hey. Um, I was wondering about the overlay that you talked about. Yep. Uh, so on a global level, if they make a, some kind of correction to a forecast, is this also reflected down to lower levels and yeah. opposite? And yeah, so effe eff effectively, we work... Um, the, the overlays work by, we worked out a, a, a system where how you take any overlay and put it down to the base unit. So in this case, that would be store product group, so that then you can aggregate up however you like. Okay, so if a local then overrides that, then it's also reflected in the aggregated one? Yeah. Okay. So you join, please. Hey, um, so on your product forecast, right? So is there some place where you capture metadata like um, seasonality or trends by product lines? Like, oh. um, Yeah, new, new at the moment, um, we haven't had to worry about that particularly. Um, the reason is, is so new stores can be a problem, um, but effectively we, that's a completely separate process that gets added on afterwards. For the, at the moment, the, I said it specifically said it's product groups. So for product groups, what tends to happen is if I have a new product group, that tends to be a rearranging of the structure with maybe one or two new products. But you know, if you like, on a group level, if I get rid of one product and replace it with another product, I s it mostly don't care. It's kind of, uh, I'll worry about it. But. I, I guess, like, where do you capture things like which products are seasonal and um, or which products are, like, are trending? Um, well, that's the model selection, right? So I can, I can have a, a, a model that can deal with seasonality or a model that doesn't care about seasonality and just score them against each other. Hey, uh, and a similar question. Have you looked at the Facebook profit for forecasting? I did have a brief look at it. I think, I think it was just we wanted to make something that worked nicely within the Tesco infrastructure. And yeah. OK, thanks. Okay, cool, that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, but they're gonna be their standards right there. You can ask them questions. Uh, yeah.